Good evening. I'm Helen Jays, and as the head of Manchester High School for Girls, I am delighted to welcome you this evening to our virtual In Conversation With event. And what we found with these virtual events is that we're able to reach such a wide audience. So thank you so much for being with us this evening. And I hope that you enjoy what I know will be a really interesting event. So tonight we have our In Conversation event with two alumni who I remember incredibly clearly from my own classroom. And I'm not surprised at all that I'm introducing both of them to you this evening as women who are excelling in their respective fields. Katie Leverton, class of 2006, will be interviewed by Amber Hack, class of 2010, and both of these women, for me personally, remembering them, reflect what is so special about MHSG, that enthusiasm and passion to challenge and to make a difference. I know that we will be in for an entertaining and fascinating hour with both of them. Before I hand over to Amber, please do submit any questions that you would like to pose in the question and answer box and they will be answered or as many as possible of them will be answered live. So over to Amber to introduce both herself and Katie in more detail. Thank you, Helen. And hello to all 97 and growing of you. That's amazing that you could join us. Um, and just to really echo what Helen has just said there, please do send us lots of questions so I can keep this as interactive as you possibly can do over a laptop. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to the next hour of getting stuck into things with Katie and learning lots about her journey. A quick uh, brief intro of who I am. Um, I am a journalist and filmmaker who has sort of done a lot of work for the BBC. Um, I've just recently gone freelance. Uh, so I started my career in news and now I find myself more in the documentary sort of current affairs world. Back up north, I left London and moved uh, back to Leeds. So that's me and Katie. We will get stuck into a bit more um, about you over this, uh, the course of the next hour. But I think a good place to start feels really a moment that most of us can probably remember leaving Man High about to enter the big wide world. And I think there's a common misconception about Man High girls that we're somehow born from birth, knowing what we're destined to do and having all our career worked out. So I just wondered how much of an idea did you have about what type of career you wanted or what interested you at that point? Um, hi everyone, firstly, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so when I left, I, I remember racking my brains for a, for a few years about what I wanted to do, because it, you know, it was a really common question people used to ask you, and what do you want to do? And I, I didn't really know. I had a, I thought maybe law, um, I'd done a few kind of, law internships and I'd always thought it was interesting and I thought a barrister might suit me and be stimulating um, and I remember doing a careers test that told me I should be an agricultural assistant um, which, which which didn't seem particularly appropriate um, but it, I, I didn't really know I also thought television might be interesting I liked watching television so I thought maybe I like being in television um, maybe an actress. So no, I, I definitely didn't have a set idea of what I wanted to do. But I was, I remember being quite desperate to find out what I wanted to do, but not really knowing the answer. Great, that brings true. Um, you, after university, uh, sort of had a very lucky and ballsy way into um, your work life. You started working for James Kahn and that came from really sort of pushing yourself to network and meet him and you stayed there for a couple of years but I'm actually quite interested in that period of time after your years of working for him because you kind of took a little bit of a brief detour 
into the BBC actually um, and I just wondered over those years from getting what was really an amazing golden opportunity off the back of the university up until that point what was going through your mind around then and why did you want to try a totally new industry? Um, well it follows on quite well from the previous question actually by the end of university I still hadn't answered my own question of what I actually wanted to do so um, it wasn't foresight that I was kind of networking at all. I, I out of interest, I was going to these lectures um, that were entrepreneur lectures. And at the time it wasn't trendy at all to kind of be interested in entrepreneurship. And so I'd go, I remember hearing the founder of Moonpig, Nick Jenkins in an auditorium with four people in there, um, me being one of them. And I was just going out of interest rather than for a career opportunity. And one of those lectures was done by James Kahn. And I ended up asking him for a job, but, and, and, or no, I ended up asking him for an internship and a few interviews later, I got one. And even in that interview, I remember him saying to me, you know, I've got my television crew that kind of helped me with the marketing side of Dragon's Den and my television personality. And then I've got my business side of things. Which side do you want to do the internship on? And I remember saying, oh, well, can I do both? Because even then, I had this idea that I was interested in television and business, but I still hadn't really decided between the two. Um, and he said, no, you know, it's a three month internship. It's better to focus your time. You should pick one. Um, and one of the guys, there was a guy in the interview that worked on his business team on the private equity side. And I thought, he seems nice. I'll work with him. Um, and that was how I made my decision at that point to not work on the television marketing team in his office. Um, so I'd, even at that point, I always had this interest in television um, and I worked for him for three years in the end. And, um, and it was interesting because what I did for him was, so I, after the internship, he, he offered me a job um, managing his Dragon's Den portfolio, which even then it was kind of this combination of business and television because um, he had a few angel investments, as we call them, that he'd done outside of the television show, but he also had the investments that he'd done on the television show in his portfolio. And so the job was to manage them. And in that instance, the, the start of managing them was to watch the television show back in, you know, on the television, it looks like they pitch for 10 minutes or whatever, but in real life, some of these pictures are two hours long. Uh, where they're basically verbally going through the details of their business plan and, um, and what's been agreed, et cetera. And so it's important to watch it back and then see really what's been agreed and try and transcribe that into a real deal. Um, so anyway, even that job intersected to some extent with television. Um, and when that came to an end, I remember a lot of people saying to me, oh, you know, you should go and train as an accountant or, you know, you, you need to build upon your financial qualifications. And, um, and by the end of it, I was just really ready for a change. And, and I just thought, if I don't try it now, I'll never try it. I've always been interested in television. I, I, was, I was really aware of the fact that it's harder and harder to take risks as you go old, get older. Um, and I've, I've never minded taking risks, which is lucky given that I'm in venture capital. Um, and, and I just found that, that this was the best time to take a risk. And I, I didn't want to be on my deathbed. It sounds a bit dramatic, but I didn't, I didn't want to think, oh, I wish I would have done this. Um, someone once told me hell is looking back at your life, at everything you could have done. Um, anyway, and I thought I didn't want that to be me. I thought this could suit me and it would be interesting. So I, I, it wasn't even just television. I decided I wanted to work for the BBC. I became obsessed with the idea of working for the BBC, applied for every job going at the BBC. Um, and yeah, eventually got onto a trainee, trainee scheme with them um, where they trained me as a journalist. And then at the end of that, um, I got a job on the one show as a researcher. That was my, how my foray into television started. Interesting. Um, and then obviously you decided that that wasn't for you and, and sort of came a bit full circle back to the business world um, and then joined the team at Innocent, which we'll all know as the food beverage brand in the supermarket. And I think it sounds like here is where 
probably not in a very linear way, but it was within that company that you started to feel like you really hit what I call your flow. And I just wondered what were sort of some of the stepping stones for you there to really help you feel like you'd you'd found your purpose? Yeah, to be honest, I didn't actually feel like I'd hit my flow there. Um, so yeah, television, I moved around a bit. I, I, I had a few different, I was, most people at the BBC are freelance. So I was freelance and, you know, they, once you're in, you're in, and there's a huge pressure to stay in because it's hard to get into. So once you're in it, you know, they look after you and they move you around. So I worked on a few different shows and um, yeah, I, I decided it wasn't for me um, for various reasons, which maybe we can go into later, but anyway, decided it wasn't for me and um, wanted to go back into the commercial world, but I was conscious of wanting more experience because I'd kind of div you know, I, I dived in right at the deep end when I'd started because I'd been working with business leaders as a kind of investor, but I hadn't had direct commercial experience myself. So I was always quite conscious of that. So I thought I'll go in on the commercial side and learn more about operational, operationally how to run a business. So started at Innocent. And again, the way I got the Innocent job was I looked, I decided I wanted to go into the commercial world. And then I looked up the fastest growing brands of the last 10 years, small to medium sized businesses. So I decided that was the kind of business I wanted to go into. And I just short, shortlisted the brands and I was just wanted to be inspired. So I shortlisted any brand that inspired me. Um, and Innocent was one of them. And then I went onto each of their websites. It was quite a formula. It went onto each of their websites and I, and I was really open to job specs. I remember that I, I, I wasn't uh, put off by job titles or, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that because I'd not really known what I wanted to be. I, I, I was open to thinking, what could I do as opposed to what am I, if you see what I mean. So yeah, this job came up on the Innocent website, which in, which was a category manager on the commercial team, which incorporated a lot of statistics and my degree incorporated st statistics, even though it wasn't, it was human sciences. Um, but anyway, so, and, and I ended up getting the job. And the truth was that the job was actually really not suited to me at all. Um, I loved the company. I thought Innocent was amazing. And it's a bit like a mini MBA. Um, so you get to experience a lot of different elements of the business and it's very transparent and uh, well run, but I really didn't like my job. So I was actually quite disappointed and I, I didn't feel like I'd found my flow at all. Um, and it was the, from that feeling um, that I just thought I need to look for something else as disappointing as that was to me. Um, I, I, I just knew it wasn't right what I was doing. So I thought I'll either have to move internally to a role that suits me more or I'll have to um, leave. And, and by that point, I'd, um, I'd come to realize that actually I was really lucky with, with, the, with my first job in that I'd found something I was good at and that I loved. The issue in the end had been the culture of where I was, that it, it was quite a toxic environment by the end. So yeah, I kind of, with that in mind, um, thought actually I'd love to get back into venture capital. And when I'd first joined Innocent, um, I remember one of the founders had said to me when I talked about my career previously, and this was the only interaction I had with the founder until, until the next point, um, right at the beginning, but he said, oh, we do some angel investing on, on the side. Um, and so when I, I didn't speak to the founders again until the point when I thought, you know, I, I don't, I have to change what I'm doing. This isn't right for me. And I remembered that conversation and I thought, God, it's, pro it's probably worth chatting to, to them uh, to at least see if I can maybe help out with that side of things, given my experience. Um, and yeah, one day I just uh, worked up the courage to speak to one of them. And I was very, very lucky with my timing because, um, we got chatting I told him about what I used to do used to be doing and he said oh I'd love you to meet my investment manager and I remember thinking um you know I'll just get that on my CV again uh where you know maybe I can help them out so that my CV looks a bit more streamlined um because I remember I'd spoken to a recruiter recently at that point to look at VC and had said oh no you're, you know you can't do that 
um, you've not been a banker and you've had a gap and all these reasons why I couldn't do it. Um, and I mean, you know, she now begs me to take interns that recruit us. So she was really talking rubbish, but it didn't feel great at the time. Anyway, so I was quite conscious that I might not be able to go straight back into it. So I should get some more experience in it. And um, so I, I, yeah, I spoke to one of the founders and from that conversation, he put me in touch with his investment manager who was heavily pregnant. And um, that conversation of me thinking, you know, I can help her out basically turned into an interview when I said, you know, I'd love to help you out. And she said, oh my goodness, I was hoping you'd say that. Um, and within two weeks of that conversation, I was, was had taken over her job alongside my old job. So I was basically doing two jobs, which I did for a year. Um, and then when the Innocent founders sold out to Coca-Cola for north of half a billion, had a lot more time and cash to decide what they wanted to do, decided that they wanted to put their efforts into backing uh, found founders and fu exciting future businesses. And they asked me to go with them. And even at that point, it was a risk. I, I wouldn't say I'd found my flow. You know, the reality was they were in a whole new section of their lives. They were only 42 when they sold the business, which is super young. Um, so there was no guarantees, but you know, I just knew that I loved working with them and I loved what I was doing and I thought it was worth the risk because, you know, as I said, I didn't like the role that I was doing at Innocent. So I left and I, I'd say it was only, it was only a couple of years into Jam Jar that I thought I found, you know, I'm happy. This is right for me. This is what I want to be doing in the sense that it felt secure. So I, I always enjoyed it, but it took a couple of years, you know, to, to do the setup. Because really, um, I set it up from scratch with them. Uh, we weren't a no name at all. Um, you know, they, people knew them as entrepreneurs, not particularly as, as investors on a wider scale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, taking it back to basics, for someone who doesn't know what a venture capitalist is, you know, tell us more and sort of what, does your average day look like? A venture capitalist invests in early stage businesses. So that's why it's called venture, uh, because they're early stage ventures and capitalists because you put, tend to put money in. And um, ideally you put your time in and advice alongside the money so that you can help the business to grow. Um, my typical day looks like um a few pitches um maybe two pitches in a day from different entrepreneurs um so there'll be we only invest jam jar invests in consumer brands so there'll be um and mostly digital consumer brands so online in some way um so there'll be digital consumer founders so i'll listen to them at the moment it's over zoom but uh, previously it was very rarely over Zoom, it was face to face, so I'll be meeting founding teams and they'll be telling me about their business. Um, then I'll probably have some team meetings um, because I uh, manage the investment team internally, so that's a key part of my job. Answering emails uh, around due diligence of businesses that we're looking to back, um, maybe chatting to one of the founders that we have backed that I advise. Um, that's a good sample of my day. Fascinating stuff. And I was um, thinking earlier about sort of us two uh, in, in what we do as a career. It's very different, but similar in a lot of ways in the sense that, you know, we provide a platform for people to express and share themselves in a way, whether that's uh, their story or their product. Um, how much do you love the people side of what you do and how integral is it? I absolutely love the people side of what I do. It's very integral. Um, it's, it's probably one of the key differences between venture capital and pure private equity. Uh, so technically venture capital is a subset of private equity, but in reality, the career path and feel of the careers are quite different. Um, so private equity, they tend to do maybe two deals a year. You know, we do five to 10 deals a year. So you're doing more deals as a venture capitalist. Um, 
you're 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 really ensuring that you get to know the people that you're backing because you are backing the people whereas in private equity yes you're backing the people but you're more backing the business and if the people don't work out you'll change them for someone else whereas venture capital if the people don't work out most likely the business will fail it's really really rare that you can find a parent for a kind of undeveloped child that is a very early stage business so a lot of it is about the 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 right reflections on who you're backing and whether they're suited to that business and uh, the the reality of how that execute you're having to make a call on that ahead of watching them execute yeah and we're having quite a lot of questions related to this in on the q a um chat and i think hypothetical situation if someone on this call is an entrepreneur or a budding one they come to you and get that golden ticket to pitch how would you say they could pique your interest um i think firstly it sounds really obvious but just doing the basics well it's really important you want so the the reality is most of the time a pitch will start with a pitch deck so we will look at a pitch deck. And so you, you've got to make sure that that pitch deck tells your story well, ideally succinctly. I think Oscar Wilde once said, I don't have time to write a long a short letter, so I'll write a long one. It's much harder to get something succinct and clear. Um, and you won't believe the amount of pitch decks that miss out what, what, what it is. So they kind of talk about the market, then talk about the opportunity, then talk about the problem, then they launch into the figures and they don't articulate clearly what what the thing actually is um or the service so i think getting the basics right can take you a long way um i think team dynamics are really important so we are very clear internally that we back teams not individuals so whether you're a sole founder or a co-founder who have you managed to get around you to help on your journey um a, so a solo founder is you know, with no team of any description is, it's a lot of pressure on one person. Um, and businesses aren't built by one person. They're always built by teams. So I think a strong team dynamic where people fill in each other's weaknesses, you don't, you want diversity, you don't want the same mold, uh, kind of everyone being exactly the same and having the same skill set. just doesn't tend to translate into a business that's more than the sum of its parts. So I think team dynamics is really important. Um, and then good attention to detail on whatever you have done. So whatever product you have created or website you have up or experience you've tested, whatever it is, having done it to the best of your ability. So taking a business as far as you possibly can without money um, is really important. And how about on the other side, someone has asked um, what advice you would give to someone who might be interested in investing for the first time? Um, depends whether they mean how to become a professional investor or how, if they have money anyway, how should they invest it? They're slightly different questions. Um, if it's the first one, how to get into investing professionally, um, I'd say... it's become a very, very trendy space. So it's become really competitive to get into. Um, so as a result, the reality is networking helps a lot uh, because the positions often aren't advertised um, because they don't need to be. So there's not that many firms, there's not that many places. So the more you can know people, know of people, the more likely you are to hear of the positions in the first place, let alone uh, be called to interview so it definitely helps now I don't mean kind of stalking people on LinkedIn and sending them loads of messages but back when the world was normal and there were lots of events just going to those events absorbing yourself in the world listening to those people even if it's on a kind of stage you're supposed to one-to-one -to -one, but being able to pitch yourself in the right way to the right person at the right time so often it's just kind of after that then following them on social media or whatever so that you're on it when a role comes up and you can reflect back. You know, I remember you, you said this, I'm a this, or just kind of 
immersing yourself in the world in advance and at least being aware of the right people and the businesses and and having uh even if it's just that having their website up and checking it every so often for those roles that's important because you know they're not going to be they're unlikely to be on kind of indeed job boards and stuff because they're so competitive um so that's on if you're wanting to start out as a professional investor the other question if you have a pot of money and want to start investing it um i, I mean I can comment within how to invest it within the consumer world. Um, you know, I think there's lots of different strategies is the truth. Um, it, it's, it's important to understand the risk that you're taking. So you firstly don't risk anything that you couldn't afford to lose um, because most of these businesses unfortunately fail um have enough money or have divvied up your pot of money enough so that you can invest in i'd say at least five if not ten businesses so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket um read through as much information as you can get get to know the founder as well as you can instincts are really important alongside the analytical side of things so um understanding who and what you're investing in as much as possible um and then making a call very, very good advice. Um, I was also interested to get your thoughts on the future of the industry, because you've touched on there certain things being very trendy and obviously it's hugely technology focused at the moment. And I think some people have fears that, you know, we are becoming so consumed by technology. Everything is for convenience and sometimes we're drowning in options and, we need to maybe slow down and not be so focused on productivity as well as um you know being a lot more conscious and aware of our consumption for the environment so i was interested to know what your thoughts are on that and you know how much that is a factor in in your thinking at jam jar um so, so sustainability is really important um in general we always look for it or aware of it, see it as an advantage. To be honest, so much so it's becoming expected, some kind of awareness of it because consumers are demanding it. The modern consumers are demanding it. So it's quite rare that we don't see an angle on, on sustainability or, um, you know, one of the things we look for is things that make the world a bit better, which is a very broad way of looking at sustainability. Um, but I think that you can still consume and not, you don't have to be unconscious of the world around you to consume. You, you know, we're seeing so many businesses now that are circular businesses. So they, you know, you'll rent, you'll rent things and then they'll be recycled within the context of the business. Um, so you can have business models that incorporate sustainability. You can, you can definitely take that into account as a business legion when you're kind of coming up with your model, et cetera. For us as investors, it is really important, um, but it's, it's as important morally as it is commercially, as I said, because consumers are demanding it and transparency of the supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um... I think as well, in a lot of people's minds, when they hear about um, how accomplished you are and everything you've managed to achieve in your career so far and all the accolades to your name, um, that you must be a woman who is powered on 24-7, you know, glued to her inbox, even on the weekends. And I just wondered, has that ever been true for you? And how do you sort of maintain that work-life balance and, and sort of be strict on boundaries? No, it's definitely not true for me and it's never been true for me. Um, I remember always feeling really intimidated by, I remember at university hearing Anna Wintour speak, who was the US editor of Vogue, and it was like, she said anyway, that she got up at 4 a.m. and played tennis and then did two hours of Mandarin and then worked and like survived on three hours sleep a night, seven days a week. And I thought, oh my gosh, I couldn't do that. Um, 
And I don't think it's healthy to set those expectations. And I've never been like that. I think what I am is quite one track minded. So when I'm working, I really am as much as possible trying to work. So I'm not looking at my phone, semi texting people and stuff. But having said that, when I'm on my weekend, I'm really on my weekend. So I'm not looking at my phone, doing work. Um, and I, that's, it's really important to me. And I really, I encourage it to my team as well. I say to them, when you're on holiday, please go on holiday. If we need you, we'll call you. I don't want you to be checking your emails to see if there's anything. And the truth is, it's so rare that we do call because I think, you know, the way I've built the team is that everyone's replaceable in a good way by somebody else on the team. So nobody, you know, you don't have this bottleneck of only this person can do this um, because then that does start creating pressure on people on their downtime. And I, I think people make better decisions, are more creative and are happier when they genuinely have downtime. So no, I'm not like that. No, I've never been like that. No, I don't admire or recommend it. Me neither. Um, someone has sent in a very interesting question um, about is being an investor a secure career path taking into account the current pandemic? And I guess we have a lot of uncertainty right now with that and Brexit. What do you think to that? I don't think any career is a secure career path um, in reality. It may be in retrospect when you look back and you've done 40 years or something, you say, oh, that was a secure career path. But I think those days are gone, unfortunately. I really felt that when I was at the BBC, for example, I remember thinking, oh, if I'd been here 30 years ago, maybe I'd really enjoy it. But now it just doesn't feel like a secure place to be, it's completely different. Um, so, you know, I think people, a job for life is so rare these days. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have found one, then that's great, but don't rest on your laurels and assume that's the case until it's been the case, if you see what I mean. Um, so do I think it's a secure job for life? No, because I don't think any job is, you shouldn't, you shouldn't assume any job is a secure job for life. How do I think the pandemic affects investing? Um, we're really excited about the impact of the pandemic because the truth is it, it's accelerated consumer trends. So there's some things that, um, you know, it, online grocery shopping, for example, the UK was already really far ahead in that, on that curve. I think it's something like 8% of grocery orders are done online. Um, but during the pandemic, that's obviously gone hugely up. And after the pandemic, you'll expect it to come down. But the truth is, we've probably gone beyond a tipping point. And it's something like once it's, I think it's at 36% of the market doing online shopping, suddenly offline stores become much more unviable. And, and so that has long lasting repercussions for the whole industry. And so I think it's really interesting that the, the changes that we're seeing and, you know, online shopping, again, the UK in general is far ahead and um, you know just general e-commerce but th this has forced some people to come online that weren't online before or didn't go online a lot and um, I think you know the way we're working a lot more zoom a lot more remote less travel all of those things are really interesting consumer trends that will have long-lasting repercussions so they create business opportunities um, so yeah, I think it's a great time to be investing. Change brings good investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think another sort of talking point during um, the pandemic and the lockdown has been people being quite saddened by what they see as a bit of the death of the high street with Debenhams and Topshop. But how do you think we can sort of keep a local community feel in business in what is an increasingly globalised world? I think the reality is people want real experiences because we're all just animals at the end of the day, we're all just monkeys. So, um, you know, we don't want to sit there all day doing this for hours on end with no other form of stimulation. It doesn't, it doesn't feed us. So to that end, people want to go to the high street and have some form of physical stimulation. The reality is, unfortunately, a lot of retail was probably built for an old world. So you know, do you need a huge, huge, in essence, warehouse where the consumer can browse for hours and hours and end? Probably not. Do you need a kind of kiosk style interface where something really theatrical and exciting happens and it's a reason to get out and socialize and see something interesting? Yes. 
I, I think we do. So I think, I don't think high streets are going to disappear. I think they're going to evolve um, and it's right that they evolve. But, um, you know, there will be, consumers will shop omni-channel is the reality. They are going to do shopping online, but that doesn't mean they're not going to leave the house and want to be entertained or stimulated. So, you know, if you look at someone like Selfridges, forget about the size of the store, but they're really, they're trying to make their in-store experience um, an experience, <laughs> not just mindlessly staring at rows and rows of clothing. It's kind of, it's a leisure time to go shopping there. That's what they're trying to do. And I think people will always want physical leisure time. So that I think high streets will evolve, but I don't think they'll disappear. Mm. So something I kind of think we all have in us is a bit of an inner critic. And I just wondered if you could sort of imagine your inner self-critic with a voice almost, what kind of things would you say it says to you? Um, I mean, it's obviously, the truth is it's changed over time in terms of the type of things it says. Um, like, you know, more recently someone left my team. It was the first person that's ever left in the seven years. Um, I've been at Jam Jar, which I think is great, but it was on a personal level, I kind of thought, even though it, the reality is it's completely natural for people to leave, but I thought, you know, have we done everything we can to keep her happy? Why is she leaving? Um, you know, I felt responsible for the fact that she wanted to leave, um, even though it was the right thing on reflection, but you know, that the, that's a good example of a recent inner critic of me just really questioning myself. Um, Another example of a recent inner critic is I interviewed someone the other day for a position and I didn't give him the job. Um, one of the reasons I didn't give him the job was I took a really bad reference on him. And I thought, you know, how, how much am I being too influenced by what somebody else thinks? This is somebody's career here that where the reality is, you know, this, this decision is, he really, really wanted the job. This decision is going to have a, an impact on him, um, a big impact on his life. And, and, you know, how appropriate is it for me to make that decision based on somebody else's knowledgeable, but still somebody else's feedback rather than me experiencing in them for myself. You know, my dad always says you should take people as you find them. So anyway, so I was really quite critical of myself in terms of have a, how am I making this decision? Have I made it in the right way, etc. cetera? Um, when I was younger, I think, I was always worried that my standards were too high about what I wanted out of a job. Um, so I was really questioned that, you know, am I expecting too much? Because I think a lot of people thought I was a bit mad trying all these different things. I had periods of unemployment along the way. Um, I was taking risks when most people don't. Um, and yeah, I, I remember thinking, I remember thinking I just kind of couldn't bear to be doing something that I wasn't really interested in. I just couldn't kind of couldn't give myself to that. I got a bit of a shock when I left university and I was sat at a desk all day, you know, nine till five. I remember really missing like being able to have a shower in the afternoon. And I thought, God, this is serious dedication. I've always been a hard worker, but you know, I think that's one of the things COVID's done well, giving you kind of more physical flexibility. But I thought, you, for me, you really have to love what you're doing because you're doing it loads um, with very little flexibility uh, five days a week, in essence, for the rest of your life. So that was just unbearable for me to think that I'd be doing that without being really interested in it. But nobody else seemed to really feel like that. Like I'd have a conversation with friends and they'd be like, yeah, it's all right. It's fine. Like, it's okay what I'm doing. And I was... And, Anyway, so I kind of thought, God, is something wrong with me? That to me, that's not okay. But everyone else seemed to think it was fine. So that that was a kind of younger critic. Um, it's interesting how uh, we sometimes don't shed that younger critic as as easily as we might expect, in line with you know how much more experience we're getting in our careers. Um, 
but I was also quite interested in how you maybe feel femininity has or hasn't featured much in your career because I was thinking about it earlier and and at the moment for the first time in my career I'm working quite closely with a team of predominantly all men um, where I'm sort of the reporter working with a male director a male executive above us and then a male producer helping in the background and it's been interesting because so far I haven't felt a massive gender difference as such other than every now and then maybe feeling like, and this is of course not an exclusively feminine trait, but every now and then I have to give them a prod and say, guys, I feel like we might need to be a bit more empathetic to this contributor we're working with, or maybe like, let's take this kind of soft attack to trying to persuade them to do this interview. And I found it interesting and maybe not a lot of people would um, know that uh, when you worked at Innocent, you know, you would work alongside, you worked alongside three male founders there um, of the brand and then you you moved with them uh, to then create Jam Jar. So I just wondered, has there been anything you felt as a woman that you feel like you brought to the table that was a skill set, or did you never really notice it? My experience in general, I've worked with mixed teams, all male teams apart from me, so they obviously can't be truly all male, and all female teams, and in my experience, the mixed teams are by far the best. I think you need that diversity. Um, so Innocent, I was on an all-female team. Um, James Kahn, I was the only woman on the investment team. Um, when I first started at Jamjar, obviously, it was uh, much more male bias, but I've we address that balance um, which is great um so we're 50 50 now um but yeah the truth is i remember my first job the, that guy that stephen that was in the first interview that i had um and one that i chose to work with i remember him saying a while in you know it's so unusual to be a woman in this industry it, it's actually it's there's a power to it because it's interesting and people will remember you for it. Um, you know, and he said, the reality is guys would rather talk to girls than other guys. And I thought, God, I never thought about it like that. It kind of, I, I kind of didn't realize that, that I was a power in being a female. And um, I think, yeah, I think it would be a shame from my perspective to say that it hasn't been an advantage because I think it has because I've been in a lot of male dominated industries and it's been helpful to be different so it wasn't to be honest it wasn't a much but it was a being a woman and being young both of those were unusual things and and so that gave you a different perspective um and you were an interesting person that people remembered and um you had a different perspective um and a different point of view and yeah I remember kind of going back to that initial inner critic question I remember when I first started working with the innocent founders thinking you know why do they actually want to work with me because they're really really competent they clearly don't need a fourth person as in they've got pretty they're pretty bad on their own just the three of them and I thought well even if it's just a different perspective you know they're 42 I'm a lot younger than them I'm a woman they're not a woman the reality is consumers are 50 50 um and a breadth of ages and so I thought even if it's just that perspective that I can bring that's different. That's something powerful. Um, over time, I've come to realise hopefully it's more than that that I add. But um, yeah, I think I think it has been useful, and I'm proud of that. Absolutely. Um, I was interested as well to to know. I think when uh, whenever you think of and meet uh, people that are extremely successful you never, we sort of just assume really that they're kind of doing it all on their own, but how important is a team to you and how important is recruiting the right people around you? It's hugely important, both personally and professionally. On a personal level, you know, starting with just the support of my parents, my teachers in school, my friends, now my husband, and hopefully one day my baby son, but they're, they're they're my team on a personal level, all of those people, and that's really important. On a professional level, it's, it's massive. You know, when I went on maternity leave, um, you know, within the last couple of years for the first time, and I couldn't, going back to that question before about switching off, 
I did switch off my maternity leave. Don't get me wrong, I worked until I had literally contractions. I didn't realise I was <laughs> also in labour. Well, just Braxton Hicks. But but then I I properly had a maternity leave. And the only reason I was able to have that quiet and that focus was because of my team were, were fully able to cope and do a brilliant job without me um, because they're brilliant. And, and, and that's just one example. You know, every day I rely on that team Hopefully they rely on me. Um, we're only small, so absolutely crucial to have a good team and recruit the right people. Um, as I said before, you know, it was painful for me when even one person left because I put so much effort into recruitment and um, pastoral care and development, etc. Obviously, everyone can't stay forever. I think um, listening to you throughout all this, what's really apparent is you've sort of built up this ability to not quieten your inner voice um, and almost built up this kind of intuition in yourself to know when something's not quite sitting right. Um, and, and how important do you think that is for anyone listening to not quieten down, you know, that tension that we can feel in ourselves when, you know, we're not fulfilling our true potential or yeah something's just not quite sitting right I think it's really important but I also think it's important to understand yourself well and you know some people for example they're wrapped with self-doubt about any decision that they make and that makes making decisions difficult but those people I think just knowing that they're that type of person alleviates some of the stress of each time they make a decision finding it very stressful um, because if you just accept that that's how you are and that's how you find decision making then I think some people get confused that that doubt is their inner voice if you see what I mean and people who say you know go with your heart or and, and it's kind of like well sometimes it can be confusing what's your heart and what's your head and um, so so I think yes your instincts are very important but don't confuse your instincts with valid doubts because you can still be brilliant and make a great decision and have doubts alongside your brilliant decision so um i think it's puts pressure on people to to expect sometimes amongst the noise that one voice will ring clear and everything else won't matter i don't think that's how people think they'll you know there'll be lots of options lots of scenarios and you'll, you'll have to weigh those up. And hopefully somewhere there'll be something inside you that kind of brings one of them up and says, I think this is the one, but it doesn't get rid of all of this. And sometimes expecting that there'll be none of this is I think a lot of pressure on people and doesn't help people make easy decision, make decision. It doesn't help make decisions feel easy. Yeah. And you um, touched just before on your son who was one years old. And I just wondered how motherhood has changed life and work for you. Um, I think the truth is that venture capital is a great career to have a child in because it's very flexible and you're in a very, very privileged position of you know, ultimately people that are pitching want something from you as opposed to, yes, of course you're selling to them, but the reality is if you're the investor, if you can't transfer the money on Tuesday because you're going to transfer them hundreds of thousands of pounds on Wednesday, they're probably going to wait that day. Whereas there's some careers where that just isn't the case and you're at the mercy of what the client wants or, you know, you have to work till midnight because otherwise you won't get paid or whatever it is. So I think, uh, venture capital in its nature is is very flexible which means that the truth is I found the transition relatively smooth um, because I'm able to be flexible so one of my hopes for COVID is that that flexibility is spread across more workplaces um, so I already when I, I went back to work at six months um, so after six months of maternity leave um and 
I arranged from the beginning to do Mondays and Fridays at home, which just meant, you know, that extra time with my son um, when I'd done my work and it, it made a big difference. And, you know, I know not everyone is entitled to that kind of flexibility, but for me, it made a huge difference. And, um, and then obviously COVID's happened during, you know, a very, my son's very young life, um, which has, you know, meant working from home full time, which has also been lovely because I've got to spend lots and lots of time with him while still in some ways being more efficient at my job because, you know, everything's gone remote. So yeah, to, the truth is I found it relatively smooth, which I think is testament to the job that I'm in mm -hmm. more than me. <laughs> Um, we are somehow in our final 10 minutes now, so I'm just going to try and do a, a quick-ish fire round of some of the questions people have sent in. So people want to know, um, well, I want to ask first, actually, what is what does it mean to be a Manchester High girl? And what of those traits do you think have stayed with you? I'm a very proud Manchester High girl. Um... Being allowed to question things, that's always yeah. felt very man high. It, it, I was always someone that questioned everything and that was always encouraged. I remember the teachers liked it. Um, and I, it, was, it was never shot down. It was kind of something that made a more interesting lesson um, to have debate and et cetera. So for me, I think healthy debate is man high. Um, <laughs> my partner would agree with you he's like do you have to question everything I'm like this is how we're making up. I'm sorry <laughs> yeah, I think fun had a lot of fun there and I, I think there were there were quite a lot of rules but I think there was always quite a lot of flexibility to be able to push the rules or even break the rules quite a lot in a good way um so I think fun um I think man high girls know how to have fun um, and hard working. I think conscientiousness was encouraged, promoted, rewarded. It wasn't something to be embarrassed about that you were working hard. So yeah, I think de healthy debate, fun and conscientiousness. Good answer. Um, so people want to know what A-levels and degree did you do? Um, I did critical thinking AS level, which I actually loved, even though we were forced to do it. But anyway, don't forget that one. I did that. I did maths, chemistry. I started doing physics and then I switched to biology. Um, and of course, philosophy and ethics, which the lovely Mrs. Jays taught me. Um, and I loved, yeah, I loved those classes. Um, so yeah, they, those were, that was what I did. And what did you do for a degree? I did human sciences at Oxford, which was, is, or is the study of the biological, social and cultural uh, uh, side of human beings. So trying to understand who we are and why we are like this. And it's the only degree at Oxford that's truly interdisciplinary. So it incorporates professors from each of the five schools um, and genuinely is half art, half science, which suited me as someone that didn't know whether I wanted to be a scientist or an artist. Um, and I just did it out of interest. I was fascinated by people. It wasn't a kind of, I didn't do it because I wanted to be a this, or I wanted to be a that. I've, I've always just kind of, the only way for me has almost been to follow my passions and then the rest will sort itself out. Just make sure I'm interested so I'm engaged. Um, someone has asked, what has been the wackiest or most surprising successful business that you have invested in? Good question. Um, uh, wackiest or most successful? Uh, yeah, it was w wackiest or just sort of um, unexpected uh, business that you ended up investing in and making a success of uh tails is a good one so tails is personalized dog food um and i remember when the guy came to pitch his pitch he this was 
it's good to be theatrical in the pitch if you can it's just entertaining um and anyway he brought this enormous bag of dog food and just like plonked it on the table he was like Love this it. is what people are carrying home from the supermarket and instead i'm going to deliver to people's doors personalized pet food um and yeah who would have thought it but that business yeah did really well for us sold to nestle within three years we made a an amazing return. Um, I think it was 25 times our money in three years. But it was a quite a wacky idea that had its hurdles along the way. Right. Uh, someone has asked if at any point in your career you've wanted to launch your own startup. Yes, but I've never known what. And I think when you're an investor as well. It, the hardest bit of being an investor is you've got to retain optimism while saying no a lot. You say no a lot more than you say yes, but if you tip over that edge and say no too many times, you'll miss the great ones. So you've got to stay optimistic in a sea of no. Um, so as a result, you have very, very high standards for what makes a good business because that's your job. You're kind of looking at businesses all the time. Um, so I have, but the truth is that over time, I think especially after I became partner, I came generally to see Jam Jar as my business. And so um, I see Jam Jar as, as the business that I'm focusing on as opposed to um, needing to necessarily start another one anytime soon. And if people wanted to get on your radar at Jam Jar, how would they do that? What kind of windows of opportunities do you have? Um, we have a cold email address, which we check, we read every email. Um, that's just on our website where you can send in your plan. Um, you can use the Man High Network to get my email and send me something that I will make sure is looked at. Um, but the truth is like, genuinely, we try rather than being, you know, we, we never Nepo I don't know what the word is, but full of nepotism. We try and uh, um, we really try and allow talent to rise to the top. So I would hope that if you send a brilliant plan, you will get seen irrelevant to how it comes through. Um, things will be quicker if you know someone through luck or any other means, um, if you can kind of get it straight to a person as opposed to a general email address, but it will get seen however you get it through. Um, we purposely don't have a phone number online because um, it's better to give everyone a fair playing field. And, you know, unlike some VC firms, they want everything in a set format, but we like to see how people put their decks together because it tells you something about the person and how they're thinking, just like, you know, how a CV is formatted tells you something about the person. So we want to get that flavor of the person. Um, so generally the best thing you can do is put together a brilliant deck that is concise, clear, with a brilliant idea, you're brilliant, and then send it to me um, or to Jam Jar, and we will look at it. Perfect. And a quick one to wrap up what's been a really fascinating chat. Somebody has asked a very funny question about who was your favorite form tutor in the sixth form? And um, I just wanted to ask you about something that was your favorite memory of your Man High days. Oh, my favorite form tutor was Peachy, who <laughs> is actually at the time was really called Miss Jennings, but. I couldn't, I couldn't even remember her name the other day because I just always called her Peachy because she was so fresh and full of life, <laughs> Peachy. Um, and she had hair the colour of a peach as well. So mm -hmm. Peachy was my, yeah. Was she my, remembers you. <laughs> did I, I, wonder if, does she, I wonder if she remembers me calling her Peachy. Um, but yes, Peachy. And one of my favourite memories... Um, Probably just being with my friends who are still my best friends today, hanging out in Crush Hall. We used to spend a long time, a lot of time in Crush Hall. Um, that was probably where I had the most fun, but I had brilliant lessons as well. Um, yeah, genuinely uh, being taught by Mrs. Jays and Miss Diamond was a highlight. That was philosophy and ethics. Um, Dr. Poucher, biology, Miss Gaskell, English. That I loved the teach. I, yeah, the, I, the, the teachers were just as brilliant as the students. So, yeah, there's loads of memories, but probably just being in Crushville with my friends is the fondest memories. 
Lovely, lovely stuff. Well, 95 of you have stayed with us. So I hope that that was a really interesting conversation for you all. Um, and I think Helen is going to jump back on to say goodbye to us all. Hello. I think Peach's name is now set in stone. Peachy, you know who you are. I know you're listening. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to both of you, Amber and Katie, for your time. It's been fascinating. And Katie, it's so refreshing to have such honesty. So thank you so much. I just wish we had more time and for us to turn the tables a bit on Amber, one for the future, <laughs> I think. Um, and I'm sure that everyone has really got something out of this evening and some real takeaways. But Katie, for me, what you said about not living with regret, um, being prepared to take measured risks, and not being closed to job titles, I think are really important lessons for young women today. Um, and also it was great to hear what you said about work-life balance. Um, so really fascinating and so brilliant to hear about how MHSG and that community that is so special to MHSG is still with you today. So it's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to our audience for being with us this evening and to all of your donations to the Bursary Fund. Thank you, Amber and Katie. It's been wonderful to see and hear you again. Um, and we'd love to do it again soon. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.